Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Priya Natarajan. I'm the current director of the Frankie Program in Science and the Humanities at Yale. And I am delighted to have you all attend today's Distinguished Speaker Series talk with Kirk Wallace Johnson. I'm delighted to see you all, though we are still virtual. We were hoping to meet you in person. First, um, I would like to take a moment uh, of uh, silence to honor those who are vulnerable in the face of the ongoing senseless war. Our collective humanity is under threat and we stand in solidarity with all of those who are suffering right now. So let's just take a few moments of silence before we start our celebratory event today. Okay, so let's join in to celebrate of the wonderful imagination of uh, a human mind, Kirk's, uh, and his book, The Feather Thief, Beauty, Obsession, and the Natural His uh, History Heist of the Century. But before we set off, I would like to thank uh, Mr. and Mrs. Richard and Barbara Frankie for their generous support of multiple interdisciplinary activities at Yale, a flagship of which is the Frankie Program in Science and the Humanities. Thank you so much. They are in attendance today with Jane Frankie. And I know that we have a draw of a very wide audience today from near and far. And we are pleased to welcome all the enthusiastic naturalists and bird watchers, in addition to our loyal following who have helped us build and sustain our community through the very isolating and difficult past two years of the pandemic. So glad to be emerging from that darkness into health, happiness, and light for all of us. I just want to remind you that we are recording this event and that all participants will therefore have their videos muted for the duration of the talk. Please feel free to type in your questions and you may submit them at any time in the Q&A feature in our webinar. I would uh, well, I want to start today by introducing uh, someone who doesn't need an introduction, Rick Prum, the William Robertson Co-Professor of Ornithology and the Curator of Ornithology and Head Curator of Vertebrate Zoology at Yale's Peabody Museum of Natural History. Rick is the former director of the Frankie Program and is a renowned scientist and acclaimed author. Many of you might have read his best-selling, The Evolution of Beauty. And I gather he has a brand new book that is expected to be out very soon. His list of seminal contributions to our understanding of the theory of evolution and his recognitions and honors awards are too numerous to recount. So in the interest of time, I will hand over the proceedings to him in just a little bit this afternoon. But before I do that, I would like to mention a couple of our ongoing projects and a few upcoming events. I wanted to remind you about our Learning by Doing project, which uh, showcases STEM videos. So please contribute, take a look at our webpage. And we have a couple of interesting upcoming events. We have the ongoing inference project talk and discussion. The next talk will be given by Kyle Cranmer on Wednesday, March 9th at 4 p.m. on Zoom. And the discussion will be a week later on March 16th at the same time with Zenna Tavares. The Distinguished Speaker Series talk, the next one will be by Carl Zimmer, and he will be talking to us on his book, Life's Edge, The Search for What It Means to Be Alive, on Wednesday, March 30th at 4 p.m. Both these events will actually be uh, virtual. We are really hoping to meet and convene in person in April, and we are hoping to debut that with um, Mapping as Knowing lecture series talk by the musicologist Vector Coelho, on April 13th, and we are hoping it will be in person in the new Humanities Quadrangle. And also watch the space, the uh, acclaimed um, jazz musician Vijay Iyer. We are hoping to have a live event in April, um, hopefully. Anyway, thank you, Rick, for offering to introduce our wonderful speaker, Kirk. Uh, take it away.
Thank you. Thanks very much, Priya, and uh, uh, and thank you for that uh, overly kind introduction. Uh, it is a pleasure to introduce uh, Kirk Wallace Johnson, uh, best-selling author and journalist, and if I can add, ad adventurer and uh, uh, storyteller par excellence. Uh, Kirk was uh, educated at the University of Chicago and later did a Fulbright Scholar uh, research in Egypt uh, studying uh, political Islamism. Um, he worked a uh, afterwards in Iraq with the U.S. Agency for International Development in Baghdad, and his experience in Iraq and following uh, that experience uh, was the uh, core of his uh, first book uh, uh, in 2014, To Be a Friend is Fatal, The Flight to Save Iraqi Americans Left Behind. Um, uh, or the Iraqis, America Left Behind. Uh, uh, this book was described by George Packer uh, as uh, riveting, darkly funny, heroic, and shaming, uh, and was a, 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 a deeply affecting book. Um, his uh, 2019 book, The Feather Thief, Beauty, Obsession, and the Natural History Heist of the Century, the subject of today's lecture, uh, was also best-selling uh, and usually uh, uh, an unusual book in the niche of ornithological true crime. Uh, and that's what we'll be uh, hearing about today. Uh, 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 Kirk has a book coming out in late summer, The Fisherman and, Dra and the Dragon, Fear, Greed, and a Fight for Justice on the Golf Course, which is about uh, immigrant Vietnamese fishing communities in Texas and Alabama. So um, uh, uh, exciting uh, events to come. Um, uh, Kirk's writing has appeared in the New Yorker, the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, the Wall Street Journal, Foreign Policy, uh, among, among many others. Uh, his work has appeared several times as well on the NPR show, This American Life, including two rare hour long programs on these things. Um, uh, Kirk has, uh, is currently a USC Annenberg Center uh, uh, Fellow uh, on the uh, uh, center, uh, a fellow at the USC Annenberg Center on Communication Leadership and Policy. Now, uh, in about 2012 or 13, at the Whitney Humanities um, Center, I was sitting down to lunch when someone asked me, uh, "Do you know or have you heard of Edwin Rist?" I almost fell out of my chair uh, because uh, I thought that I was maybe alone in the world to being obsessed with Edwin Rist. Uh, the, my questioner told me that uh, uh, she had a friend who was also obsessed with Edwin Rist and was thinking of writing a book. Uh, I soon got in touch with Kirk uh, about that and uh, began a, a, a marvelous correspondence. Soon we realized we had to uh, meet and Kirk visited in New Haven uh, for a marvelous couple days where we talked about feathers endlessly. And I talked about feathered anatomy and development, and uh, and and uh, and and on and on. Uh, really, Kirk had sort of a mini graduate seminar in feather <laughs> biology uh, 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 over those days. Um, of course, um, uh, uh, Kirk went on to uh, uh, do further research, which is the subject of the book. So I won't I won't go any further, except to pick um, one little uh, bone of contention that I'm. Going to raise, and that is uh, um, when the book came out. Uh, I was portrayed as a one-dimensionally potty-mouthed ornithologist. <laughs> in fact, that feature became the teaser at the top of the hour in the you know the beginning of Act Two uh, in in This American Life. So much so that uh, when my uh, mother's friends I said, "I heard your son on NPR." And uh, she asked me, well, why didn't you tell me you were going to be on NPR? I, I was, uh, I was uh, 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 afraid to tell her. But in fact, <laughs> uh, uh, it, 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 you know, I must say uh, in, the heavy, in the years with heavy rotation of this program in the years since, uh, every once in a while, I'll get an email from an old high school friend or from an acquaintance from long past saying, hey, I heard you on NPR. Uh, usually <laughs> always referring to the same moments. Now, well, the moment is, a, a, you know, a, a, an enthusiastic and... Uh, highly energetic expletive 
uh, which uh, which featured uh, in both the book and in this <laughs> and I just want to say now uh, I, you know I had hoped for more balanced portrayal uh, but I know in the interest of of of, of the story uh, that uh, 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 which was indeed riveting uh, that, that that's the source of it so I just wanted to report on that and I, I just want also to tell you that uh, Kirk my mom is in the audience today Okay, uh, so, uh, so uh, I am not, well, not watch your mouth though. You now, but I, I but that, there it is. Uh, take it away, Kirk, and thanks very much for uh, for uh, taking the time to uh, uh, join us at the Frank program. Uh, thank you for that kind kind intro, Rick. Uh, and you have my apologies for that. I would just say, watch your mouth when <laughs> when you talk to a journalist with a recorder. Um, I want to thank Yale and the and the Frankies for for having me. Uh, this is a this is a you know I think part of the the, the appeal that people have uh, expressed about this book is that it, there's a bit of escapism to it, and we're in some particularly heavy times. And so, um, even having written it, I still enjoy the opportunity to kind of dive back into this story. Um, I'm going to, um, since we're, we have the advantage to uh, look at some, some pictures and videos and audio, I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, and I'm gonna open with a, um, uh, I'm gonna open with a kind of startling piece of audio um, that happened during one of the interviews, don't worry, Rick, it's not, it's not yours. Um, but this is uh, probably two years into my investigation, um, speaking to a South African uh, Victorian salmon fly tire who I suspected as having some of the stolen birds that you'll hear about. Um, the fact that it happened, I don't think is shocking at all. Um, and it's not because of the feverish demand or anything, it's where there's where something is scarce, where something is really difficult to get hold of. And, you know, there's enough people that want it, forget about the, you know, feverish demand around it. People, people are creative. They're going to find ways to source what they need. Um, and it really is as simple as that. It, it, you know, and in terms of severity of the crime, and please, I, I, I don't know if you, you know, well, you can quote me on anything. I don't really care. But in terms of severity of crimes, this, in my opinion, just doesn't rate that highly. These are skins that are sitting in, in cupboards somewhere. Um, do I condone it? No, not at all. Anything that is wrong is wrong. Wrong is wrong and right is right. It's as simple as that. For me, the biggest shock was that it was Edwin. Okay, now I'm going to do a quick reading from the prologue. I don't really like reading very very often be, partly because i have um i have a five-year-old and a four-year-old and i have this habit of kind of breaking into a, a sing-song dr seuss voice so uh forgive me if that happens but I, i'm gonna read you a brief passage from the prologue just to kind of set the scene for those of you who haven't read the book this uh pertains to the events of of june 23rd 2009 by the time Edwin Riss stepped off the train onto the platform at Tring, 40 miles north of London, it was already quite late. The residents of the sleepy town had finished their suppers, the little ones were in bed. As he began a long walk into town, the train glided off into darkness. A few hours earlier, Edwin had performed in the Royal Academy of Music's London Soundscapes, a celebration of Haydn, Handel, and Mendelssohn. Before the concert, he'd packed a pair of latex gloves, a miniature LED flashlight, a wire cutter, and a diamond blade glass cutter in a large rolling suitcase and stowed it in his concert hall locker. He bore a passing resemblance to a lanky Pete Townsend, intense eyes, prominent nose, and a mop of hair, although instead of shredding, shredding a fender, Edwin played the flute. There was already a new moon that evening making the gloomy stretch of road even darker. For nearly an hour, he dragged his suitcase through the mud and gravel skirting the road under gnarly old trees strangled with ivy. A car blasted by, its headlights blinding, adrenaline coursing, he knew he was getting close. The entrance to the market town of Tring is guarded by a 16th century pub called the Robin Hood. A few roads beyond, nestled between the old Tring brewery and an HSBC branch lies the entrance to public footpath 37. 
Known to locals as Bank Alley, the footpath isn't more than eight feet wide and is framed by seven foot high brick walls. Edwin slipped into the alley into total darkness. He groped his way along until he was standing directly behind the building he'd spent months casing. All that separated him from it was the wall. Capped with three rusted strands of barbed wire, it might have thwarted his plans were it not for the wire cutter. And after clearing an opening, he lifted the suitcase to the ledge, hoisted himself up and glanced anxiously about. No sign of the guard. He reached toward the window with the glass cutter and began to grind it along the pane. Cutting glass was harder than he had anticipated though. And as he struggled to carve an opening, the glass cutter slipped from his hand. His mind raced, was this a sign? He was thinking about bailing on the whole crazy scheme when that voice, the one that had urged him onward these past months, shouted, wait a minute, you can't give up now. You've come all this way. He crawled back down and picked up a rock. Steadying himself atop the wall, he peered around in search of guards before bashing the window out, wedging his suitcase to the shard strewn opening and climbing into the British Natural History Museum. Unaware that he had just tripped an alarm in the security guard's office, Edwin pulled out the LED light, which cast a faint glow in front of him as he made his way down the hallways toward the vault, just as he rehearsed in his mind. He wheeled his suitcase quietly through corridor after corridor, drawing ever closer to the most beautiful things he'd ever seen. If he pulled this off, they would bring him fame, wealth, and prestige. They would solve his problems. He deserved them. He entered the vault, its hundreds of large white steel cabinets standing in rows like sentries, and got to work. He pulled out the first drawer, catching a waft of mothballs. Quivering beneath his fingertips were a dozen red rough fruit crows, gathered by naturalists and biologists over hundreds of years from the forests and jungles of South America. Their coppery orange feathers glimmered despite the faint light. Each bird, maybe a foot and a half from beak to tail, lay on its back in funerary repose, eye sockets filled with cotton, feet folded close against the body. He unzipped the suitcase and began filling it with the birds, emptying one drawer after another. Now, <laughs> I'm going to interrupt myself. Uh, I'm under no obligation to, to say this or relay this, but I'm feeling generous towards the British Museum today. So I, I will say that this of the of everything in the book, this is the one thing that they dispute. But down in the security office, the guard was fixated on a small television screen. Engrossed in a soccer match, he hadn't yet noticed the alarm indicator blinking on a nearby panel. This led to a very surreal exchange with, with the British Museum where they, they said there wasn't a soccer match happening that, that night. I had to prove that there was. Uh, and then they said that the guard doesn't like soccer, which to which I replied, you know, as he does, he's British. I'm, I'm sure he does. But anyways, moving on. Edwin opened the next cabinet to reveal dozens of resplendent Quetzal skins gathered in the 1880s from the Cherokee cloud forests of Western Panama, a species now threatened by widespread deforestation and protected by international trees. At nearly four feet in length, the birds were particularly difficult to stuff into his suitcase, but he maneuvered 39 of them inside by gently curling their sweeping tails into tight coils. Edwin had lost track of how long he'd been in the vault when he finally wheeled his suitcase to a stop before a large cabinet. A small plaque indicated its contents, Paradiseidae. 37 king birds of paradise swiped in seconds. 24 magnificent rifle birds, 12 superb birds of paradise. And to show you what we're talking about here, Uh, okay, wrapping up the prologue here, and then we'll, we'll get into it. Um, the guard glanced at the CCTV feed, an array of shots of the parking lot and the museum campus. He began his round, pacing the hallways, checking the doors, scanning for anything awry. Edwin had long since lost count of the number of birds that passed through his hands. He had originally planned to choose only the best of each species, but in the excitement of the plunder, he grabbed and stuffed until his suitcase could hold no more. The guard stepped outside to begin a perimeter check, glancing up at the windows and beaming his flashlight on the section abutting the brick wall of Bank Alley. Edwin stood before the broken window, now framed with shards of glass. So far, everything had gone according to plan. All that remained was to climb back out of the window without slicing himself open and melt back into the anonymity of the street. Now, when I first heard about this crime, um, 
the, the two big questions that I began with in my investigation were these. One, what, what was this collection at the British Museum, the second largest in the world? They have 750,000 bird skins. They have miles of birds on shelves and spirits hundreds of thousands of eggs. What, what were they doing there? I didn't know anything about, I, I thought all there was with the Natural History Museum was just what you see displayed in the cases on, a, on your school field trips. Um, were they, as the feather thief claimed, just sitting in some basement gathering dust or did they have some other purpose? And the second question is, what on earth possessed Edwin Rist, a 20 year old American to scale the wall that night and to steal them? To, to what end? The best way to answer that first question is to introduce you to this guy. And I gather there are a lot of ornithologists uh, tuned in today, so they, they'll know him right away. But this is Alfred Russell Wallace. Um, the best way to, to get into this, this, this was a, a, someone who, I mean, there are, there's shelves sagging with biographies of Wallace, so I won't, I won't do the whole run through. But, but the, the compressed version is he was inspired by, by Darwin and the Voyage of the Beagle to, to go out in pursuit uh, of an answer to the question that was bedeviling naturalists at the time, what is the origin of species? And young Wallace, who was not a, a highly educated guy, saved up his money and booked passage to Brazil where he spent four years in intense privation building a collection of specimens. Um, birds, beetles, sketches, you know, fish skeletons, uh, you know, everything he could, uh, because the, the thinking was that you go and build this collection up and bring it back home and spend the next, you know, part of your career closely evaluating these specimens and looking for points of divergence and what inferences you might make. Um, and after four years, he loads all of these things up on a, on a boat and about a week or so into the voyage back home, he's uh, woken by a, a shipmate telling him that the, that the ship is on fire. Uh, and he scampers up to the deck and he can see the smoke curling up through the, the planks of the ship and, and he knows everything is, is gone. He had something like 10,000 bird skins, um, uh, like a, an, it would have been a career establishing uh, uh, collection. Um, as as the crew as the crewmen were jumping onto the life rafts, he scampered down and and grabbed a couple of his notebooks and a, a pocket watch and a sextant and and barely escaped. But he returned to London threadbare, broke, uh, and with really not much to his name. But astonishingly, he he wrote his way into the scientific establishment. That he published two books within the next eighteen months, a number of journal articles, and was sort of invited into a lot of these royal societies who then backed his next uh, expedition, which was uh, roughly eight years in the Malay archipelago. Um, now, while he was there in the Malay archipelago, um, he was the first, uh, oops, where is, there we go. Uh, sort of Western naturalist to lay eyes on, on this, this is the, the king bird of paradise. Um, and it was an astonishing thing to him. He, he, um, he described this as uh, having an otherworldly beauty, an intense cinnabar red body, a rich orange head, deep metallic green spots above the eyes. Um, and he was overcome. Wallace wrote that, he said, I thought of the long ages of the past during which the successive generations of this little creature had run their course year by year being born and living and dying amid these dark and gloomy woods with no intelligent eye to gaze upon their loveliness to all appearances such a wanton waste of beauty. But then Wallace recognized that he, he, he understood what the threat was of what he described as, you know, if civilized man were to ever discover these birds that he would come charging in and basically disrupt the the conditions the world that gave rise to this beauty and and kill it off uh, and, he, and he wrote that this this consideration must surely tell us that all living things were not made for man um and and one thing to notice this is an extraordinary i, I feel embarrassed describing any birds in front of rick here but just 
pay attention to those tail feathers because they'll they'll come up in a moment here. But these are these sort of jade discs that that um, that in the in the mating display the king bird of paradise will kind of wobble these things back and forth and it's an extraordinary thing to to witness um now i'm not going to get into the whole uh extraordinary story but of of what happened with wallace but while he's there he basically contracts malaria and in a malarial fever uh pieces together the theory of evolution through natural selection he's impatiently waiting for his fever to break and he writes the, the first paper intended for publication to to proffer an answer uh to this question and he puts it in the mail and sends it to charles darwin uh i'm not suggesting that darwin stole it but it, it did spur darwin into kind of accelerating his own publication schedule of the origin of species um now wallace returned to to london with his collection intact um, and sets out to write uh, this incredible book called the Malay Archipelago, which you should read if you haven't. But I just want to touch back on his his premonition of what would happen if quote unquote civilized man were to discover these birds. Uh, and that threat came quicker than he anticipated in the form of, of this. Um, the, the Victorian feather fever uh, if, if there is such a thing as a patient zero, we think it's Marie Antoinette who, who wedged a diamond encrusted egret feather into her, into her hair and set off this kind of global uh, arms race for, for where, where women were competing to show status by, by wearing feathers in their hair or entire bird skins uh, mounted to their hats. Um, this, this set off a a worldwide destruction. Uh, it, it seemed that whatever species was in vogue that month would be pushed to the brink of extir extirpation, at least. Um, by, by one historian's account, it's the single largest direct extermination of wildlife um, by, by humans, uh, and it was to feed this marketplace, uh, which was itself inflamed by, you know, new innovations in mass media like rotary printing presses and magazines that were pushing these images throughout the world. The, the, the inaugural cover of Vogue, for example, has a, a woman with feathers in her hat. Um, you can see an example here. I mean, the, it's, it might be hard to see, but on the left, that's a, a photo of an auction lot. And I think there's a thousand hummingbirds for sale there. Some of the, the things that I um, came across while researching this book were horrifying. I mean, coats that were being sold that had there was one shawl that was made of 7500 hummingbird skins stitched together um uh, on the right was a kind of uh the, i mean it's from punch magazine which is a kind of satirical um uh publication but criticizing women's fashion for 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 leading to the uh destruction of, of bird life but um but Lest it seem that I'm kind of uh, pointing a damning finger at, at at women, it was men doing much of the killing, and it was also women that led the the charge to pull us back from the brink. It was women that revitalized a, a moribund Audubon society. It was women that founded the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. Um, and both of these have pledges that you know their memberships have to their members have to take an oath not to not to wear feathers or to uh, to wear bird skins and this was a sort of revitalization or a, a, some some people have argued like a a, a a new birth of the conservation movement was to pull us back from bird slaughter the first the first uh, wildlife refuge shut up in the united states was to cut down on on snowy egret poachers in the florida everglades um, at that time in the early 1900s an egret was egrets plumes were worth something like four times their weight in gold. Um, now, Alfred Russell Wallace was no dummy. He understood that um, with, with the industrialized slaughter of bird life playing out across the planet, he began to implore the British Museum to, to protect 
his specimens and others, but to maintain a, a collection for, for future generations. Um, he knew, he described these birds as the individual letters that make up the, the, the words and the sentences and ultimately the volumes of the earth's deep history. And if we allow them to be destroyed, then we're basically blinding ourselves to the past. Um, upon his death in 1913, um, the, the British Museum uh, added his collection, um, uh, his, his specimens to their collection, but the threat to them commenced immediately. In World War I, there were 200,000 pounds of, of, of thermite bombs dropped by German Zeppelins over London. In World War II, there were 28 direct hits on the Natural History Museum in London. Uh, which prompted the curators then to, to marshal a fleet of, of unmarked trucks to basically secret these birds out in the dead of night to a countryside uh, museum in the town of Tring, uh, where, they were, where they were assumed to finally be safe from outside threat. Wallace understood that these specimens likely held answers to questions that scientists hadn't even thought of yet. And so the stakes here were huge. Um, no, one, no one could have imagined that after surviving Hitler, uh, that the ultimate threat to these birds would come from, a, from, a, from an American fly tire uh, in the 21st century. And this leads us to the second question. So what prompted Edwin to climb the wall that night and to steal these things? And the quickest way to, to show you that is to give, is to do, this is a, a, a compressed video here, but this is this is what we're talking about. This is a Victorian salmon fly. These things can take upwards of eight eight plus hours to tie, uh, and they are uh, tied according to these nineteenth century books that have kind of are are revered as an, an almost sort of monastic uh, religious. <laughs> Uh, levels in terms of like the, the adherence to the particular recipes that these flies have. At the same time that women were showing off their status by wearing these birds, these exotic birds in their hats, their aristocratic husbands were plucking feathers off and, and tying them into these admittedly beautiful patterns uh, into salmon flies, which, that, which took on these fancy names like the Jock Scott and the Green Highlander and the Evangeline and Exordium. Now it's it's worth it's it's worth mentioning here um, that uh, what we know of salmon now is that they're you know essentially colorblind when they're when they're spawning. They're not. There's no. You don't have to be an evolutionary biologist to piece together that there's no there's no earthly reason why a salmon in Scotland would ever come across a bird of paradise feather from from the highlands of New Guinea, but. This was uh, an, uh, essentially a, an art form that um, was hugely popular in the 19th century, kind of slipped into a, 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 a very uh, near oblivion in the 20th century until the birth of the internet, uh, at which point these books resurfaced and, uh, and eBay came and a lot of people started finding these women's hats in their, in their grandma's attic and, and all of a sudden these birds that they hadn't seen before were available to buy. Um, and, and so this then brings us to young Edwin Rist. Um, born in, in Manhattan, raised in, in Hudson Valley. Uh, he was 10 years old when he was walking through his parents' living room when his dad, who was a freelance journalist, uh, was writing a piece for Popular Mechanics on the physics of, of casting a fly. And he was watching an Orvis sort of 101 video um, and Edwin walked through the room uh, when they were demonstrating how to tie a simple trout fly. And there's a point in the process where there's a, there's a technique called palmarine hackle, but where you take a feather, you tie it to the hook. And then when you, you can take an ordinary, you know, chicken feather, and when you coil it around the shank of the hook, every one of those little fibers splays out and it turns something that's very ordinary looking into something that is extraordinary looking. And for, for trout 
fishing where, where you're actually tying flies that are made to resemble the insect life in and around the river. There's a purpose to this. The, the, those feathers could be used. Uh, these are not exotic or rare feathers. Like I said, they're turkey or chicken, uh, but they might be used to help the fly stay afloat on the surface of the river or to mimic, you know, uh, um, the, the legs of the insect. Um, but Edwin was just ensorcelled by this um, and raced to the basement, found some, some fishing hooks, ran to his parents' bedroom and pulled some feathers from his mom's pillow and started trying to tie his own flies. He was at the time a, already a, a, a virtuoso flautist. Uh, and so in between, um, you know, studying and, and practicing the flute, he became an obsessive trout fly tire. And his parents uh, who were homeschooling him would take him to these, uh, these tournaments throughout New England. Uh, I've been to them. They're, uh, they, if they sound a little nerdy, they, <laughs> they are. And I say this as someone who's a, as a, as someone who is a fly fisherman, but they're a uh, picture, large ballrooms with, uh, tons of booths of celebrity fly tires who are all hunched over little vices, um, tying, tying flies. And, and Edwin would compete where, you know, they would tell you, you need to tie as many of these flies as you can within, within an hour. Uh, and he started mopping up and winning first prize, first prize. And it was at one of these events that he first came across these Victorian salmon flies. And as soon as he saw them, he fell in love with them, uh, realized that he no longer wanted to tie these sort of drab, ugly looking trout flies. He wanted to tie these extraordinarily beautiful salmon flies. And he uh, started getting private tutoring from a master fly tire up in Maine. Uh, but he immediately was confronted with a problem. This 15 year old did not have much disposable income uh, when compared to the other members of this sort of uh, underground community. So a bird would come up on eBay, but he was never able to to afford it because there were grown men spending thousands of dollars on, on it uh, for their own feather collection. So, I mean, Edwin, despite this, uh, I mean, he was able to use what the, that community refers to as subs, but substitute feathers where they're dyed, uh, you know, pheasant or turkey or chicken feathers dyed to look like the exotic uh, recipes in these 19th century books. Uh, he was, he got so good at this that he was hailed as the future of fly tying uh, in Fly Tire Magazine, which uh, to my wife's embarrassment, uh, I'm, I've been a subscriber to for years now when I, when I first discovered this story. Um, but, uh, but as good as he was, his, his mastery of this was always defined by a kind of longing for what he couldn't afford. And so at 18, when he was admitted to the Royal Academy of Music in London, he receives an email right before leaving from a, a friend of his and a mentor who said, hey, while you're there, you've got to get into this collection. You've got to see these birds. It will blow your mind. Do whatever you do, whatever you need to do, but get in there and see the, the Natural History Museum's collection. So Edwin lies to the British Museum, says that he's a photographer who needs to take photos of Alfred Russell Wallace's Birds of Paradise on behalf of a friend who's doing a dissertation on them. And the museum trusting him, um, which, you know, to be fair, it's not, I don't condemn them for that. These, as Rick can attest, this is, these are, the curators are stewards of these collections and they're there to ad advance human human knowledge. They can't exist in a bunker where nobody can see them, but that calibration has, has bedeviled museums all over the world of who gets in and who doesn't and how do you assess risk. Uh, and it's certainly been complicated by, by the story you're, you're about to hear. But he goes to train, signs his name into the logbook and, and they, he's deposited in front of, uh, I think the red rough fruit crow was maybe the first uh, species that he was allowed to photograph. And he starts 
snapping pictures. But while he's there, he also starts taking pictures of of the location of the cabinets and the windows and the entry and exit points. And he's building a kind of visual map um, of, of the museum. Um, now, it took me uh, nearly four years to get him to agree to an interview. But I, in that interview, I asked him to describe how it felt uh, when he was inside the sort of private uh, or non-public part of the British Museum. And this is how he described it. So you can tell almost as soon as he's there, you know, encountering these, I mean, if, for example, the, the, the Natural History Museum in Trang had um, 48 red rough fruit crows, which were selling for something at the time, they were selling for something like $6,000 per skin. Um, he would pull open tray after tray of birds and see massive, extraordinary financial value. Uh, but he also, as a fly tire, saw the, the creative potential that he, if he had these things, he would be able to tie whatever he wanted without having the pressure of, of scarcity. So as, I, as you heard in the in the prologue, but he, uh, he ends up taking these things after eight months of plotting this heist. Um, and he, during those eight months leading up to the heist, he registered edwinrisk.com, which he set up as a sort of online marketplace. Um, he ordered these, you know, the diamond blade glass cutter and, and other things on eBay. He, this part just seemed impossible to be true, but he created a, uh, a word document with, uh, which was entitled plan for museum invasion dot doc, uh, where he sort of, uh, built his strategy. Uh, and then after performing, um, in London boarded the train, stole 299 specimens from the museum. Of those 48 red rough fruit crows, he stole 47 of them. He just, the guards think that, or the curators think that he just didn't see one that was kind of wedged in the back of the drawer. Um, crucially, the, I mean, I, some of these species, the, the numbers are smaller, but I think he took, I have to check, but I think he took something like 17 flame bower birds um, which may not seem like a significant number, but there were some at the time, there were something like 30 flame bower birds in all of the research institutions in the world. Um, and in case it, it, it should be obvious, but what, you know, some of these birds have been there and preserved by this chain of curators since before the word scientist was even coined. So when, once you steal a, a, a bird gathered from from this forest or this island in 1850, that bird might still be there now, but you can't go and get the, get another one from that from 1850. I mean, this seems blindingly obvious, but um, but the the whole point of these collections is to have these sort of almost like uh, genetic snapshots of of you know what 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 the species was like back then, and 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 uh, so that we can understand how things are changing. So. Um, the the guard did not whether he was watching a soccer match uh, or not he did not catch Edwin that night he climbed back out uh, he missed the train back to London and spent a very kind of ang angst ridden three or four hours at this tiny uh, train stop with a million dollars worth of dead birds in a suitcase uh, you know terrified the cops were coming for him got back to his dorm room, spread the birds out on the bed, told uh, one family member that he, he felt like the richest uh, man in the world um, having these collections and then proceeded to start uh, chopping them up and hacking the, you know, the breastplates, which are the only thing that fly tire, tires care about of the red row fruit crow. He would hack those out and he, he took a, a series of approaches. Sometimes he would sell um, uh, here's his website and I, I, I have, uh, it's especially, uh, great to be able to do this, uh, with, with Yale and with Rick today, because 
when Rick first heard about this, um, he had the foresight to take these screenshots, the only ones that exist of Edwin's website, which were subsequently, you know, obliterated from the web. Um, but these are to anyone watching this who was a curator or works with these collections. These are obviously study specimens. These are museum specimens that he's posting on a public site. He's using their Latin binomials. He's not. He's not even using this the slang for these things. Um, but he would he would sell full birds. One American uh, dentist. There's a lot of dentists in this story. I think it's because dentists are good with working with little tools in tight spaces. And so I kept never, that's my best theory, but a one American dentist boarded a plane for London and, and bought something like $10,000 worth of birds. All of these guys that bought from Edwin, and we're talking about a total of like some several hundred thousand dollars worth of, of stuff that the British authorities allege that he sold. None of them seemed to wonder or maybe did not want to to ask how a college student was suddenly sitting upon the most valuable private collection of priceless uh, exotic specimens in the world, but, but they were quite happy to just do the transactions. Now, here you'll see some of my obsessive screenshotting over the years, but here's a, these are private Facebook group exchanges where they're they're stressing to each other that you never talk about the price, you only do this over over private message. These are birds where you can see the tags, um, which bear all the bio data on the, tied, onto their, tied to their feet. Um, he would also, um, hang on, my screen just froze here, here we go. He would also post photos like this to these forums um, where you have to understand some of these, you know, that bottom row of feathers, you know, six of them, are a are hundred dollars. And I, I remember asking Rick this, but I think the breastplate would ha has something like maybe 800 feathers on it for a single bird. And he stole 48 of them or 47 of them. So you can do the math of how quickly this becomes lucrative. Here, this is July 27th, 2010. This is before, before the arrest. Uh, before he was eventually caught, the, the fly tying forums that he would sell these on are joking about uh, the price that Edwin is charging and, and the, the 3000 percent markup that he's that he's making on birds stolen from a natural history museum. Now, the, it took the British Museum 35 days to realize that they were actually missing specimens. They, the, the morning after the heist. They raced over to to the cabinets collect uh, housing Darwin's birds. Uh, and it's kind of a final blow to Wallace, but had they had they cared about Wallace as much as Darwin, they probably would have uh, checked Wallace's specimens as well and realized that they had been burgled. But they, they concluded within a day or so that it was a sort of failed break and enter and, and basically breathed a sigh of relief. And it wasn't until a month or so later that a visiting researcher came and opened up the trays, the trays that were uh, supposed to be holding the red rough fruit crows and found them empty. And so the museum then did an inventory, they made the tally, they announced the heist. Um, um, the detective assigned to the case did a number of interviews of the staff to, to rule out an inside job. Uh, but I mean, and the, the British Museum doesn't like this characterization. I can understand why, but I, I think they quickly just came to uh, an assumption that the birds had probably all been chopped up. Um, I, for the life of me, I don't, uh, I don't understand. I've been through this many times now, but uh, you know, Edwin Rist was emailing them about the very birds that were subsequently stolen. They were he signed his real name into their logbook. Um, but for whatever reason, it, it took 15 months for law enforcement to finally turn their eyes on Edwin. And that was not because of, with all respect to the, the wonderful British detective who was running point on this case, uh, it wasn't because of gumshoe work. It was because another um, uh, 
police officer um, who was not assigned to the case, um, but who was an avid fly tire, went to a, a festival in, in Holland where he saw um, someone showing off a priceless specimen. Uh, and he started, you know, he, he, he knew about the train heist and he started asking questions. And so that, that law enforcement officer who I'm obligated to, to uh, protect his anonymity, but he's the one that tipped off the authorities and that led to Edwin's arrest. Um, now, uh, I want to I want to get us to to Q and A, but um, I don't want to go through every twist and turn of of my subsequent investigation. But um, but a couple photos here of the crime scene evidence. So, of the two hundred and ninety nine birds stolen, the police recovered one hundred and two of them that were intact with their labels attached, which is a crucial detail. If the labels are cut off, they're essentially meaningless for research or greatly diminished for research. Um, 72 were intact, but were missing their labels. And beyond that, they found a mountain of Ziploc bags filled with severed parts of birds. After the news of the arrest, another 19 skins, all of them missing their, their labels were returned by mail anonymously. Um, and as far as the skin still at large, about a third of them were still missing. And so even though, and here you'll see the, the resplendent quetzals where the tails have been hacked off and, and sold off to the community. Um, but even though the, the British Museum described this as a catastrophic theft from humanity, and even though they still hadn't recovered a huge number of skins, they announced after the arrest that we're, quote, we're pleased the matter is resolved. Um, when I first heard about this and then realized that not only had this really happened because it just seems so impossibly strange, but that there was still, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of these skins and feathers floating around this sort of black market. Um, and that, uh, that the feather thief had basically had never spent a night behind bars, and we can get into that in Q and A. But he he was basically given a slap on the wrist. He was allowed to graduate from the Royal Academy of Music and go on his way. That the that the British authorities were no longer looking for the specimens, uh, and that I was seen as I was getting deeper into the what I kind of jokingly call the feather underground. That they were basically just cracking jokes about it all. Um, that it, it struck me as wrong on a very basic level. Uh, and so I, this was a, a five plus year investigation where I went all over the world, infiltrating this community, turning people into sources. Um, and, and I'm happy to discuss that investigation, but, uh, but among the most shocking revelations of it, uh, I'm now at five separate museum heights that have been carried out by fly tires in the last 20 years. Um, Edwin's uh, was the worst that we know of, but it's by no, mean an by no means an isolated occurrence. Um, even when I launched this book, the first event launching this book was at the Los Angeles Natural History Museum. And shortly before the event, the, the head of their bird collection took me over and showed me a, a cabinet and showed me the crowbar marks where somebody had pried open a case and stolen the same species of birds um, that were uh, targeted in the Tring heist. Um, there's a, an American fly tire who was posing, he had a, he won a pest control, uh, uh, contract with a couple of museums in, in Europe. And he would go in at night and spray for, for insects. And then he would take priceless birds into his coveralls and, and, and slip out. Um, he was never caught. Um, so, um, you know, I just I just wanted to say that this is a uh, this is a story that uh, I initially thought was just kind of a quirky, you know, why on earth would people steal steal birds? But it very quickly became something much more profound about our our relationship to the to a, a changing planet and vanishing wildlife, and and also the kind of blinders that that a obsession can give to people. Just to end it on a, on a lighter note, um, towards the end of what was an eight hour interview with the feather thief, I, I was trying to lighten the mood and I, I said, 
hey, you know, like when you when you go on a date with somebody, do you do you feel like the need to say just so you know, like I'm I'm a feather thief, but I'm you know whatever. And I saw his his brow furrow when I used the word thief, and I said, well, is that a problem? Like, do you do you not like that word? And this is how he answered. Uh, I hope hopefully you could hear that. I don't know if the audio was good enough, but um, uh, I, you know I'm not a psychiatrist or psychologist, but I think the the term for that is compartmentalization. Uh, so all right, so I'm going to stop my my screen share here, uh, and and I I would love to uh, dive into questions if you have any. Uh, but I'm, again, I'm really grateful to to Rick and to the to the Frankies and, and Yale for for making this happen, and I, I hope that sets the table enough here for us to, to have a chat. Great, Thank, thanks so much, Kirk. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and um, I'll just say that uh, since uh, nobody has to get in a car and drive home, uh, you know, we, we're, here, we're gonna uh, let the questions uh, go with, uh, for, for a while. Um, thanks, Kirk. You know, uh, it's always striking uh, to be reminded of this. And obviously you documented how the worldwide impact on scientific capacity to study these, uh, this, this biodiversity. Uh, I'm really struck by that, uh, that description uh, of, or, or uh, Edwin's description of himself as somebody who really understands the feathers. You know, for him, somebody who really understands the feathers is what, what they materially do uh, as you wrap them around a hook, uh, not the role of feathers in the biology of the bird. Uh, the, the, exactly. And, and, and you probably, I imagine you probably were pulling your hair out if, if, when you got to this point in the book, but I mean, he, he was pushing a, a mountain of just junk science uh, in the interview where he said, you know, essentially uh, after a hundred years, you can't, you can't really pull any DNA from them anymore. And, and uh, you know, all, all the, the real value is really just in the, the, you know, height and weight and that's kind of it. So, um, there were a lot of points where I had your kind of your, as you described it, mini graduate seminar in my head during the interview where I wanted to, to say, are you nuts? But I just, I just, I wanted to just let him he sort of hang himself with these comments. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, we have lots of great questions. I just remind people, uh, if you have questions, put them in the Q and A, we're, we're monitoring it. Um, uh, first from, from Katie, is wrist still tying flies? Oh, that's a great question. One that I don't think I can, I can't answer definitively, but, um, because as you might imagine, he, he and I are not really close at this point. Um, uh, but he, he claims that he's not, uh, and I have not seen any posts of his, uh, in these communities where, where you would see them. So uh, if, if he is, he's doing it privately. And from Judith, a question, whatever became of Edwin's brother, was he implicated in the crimes uh, uh, and theft or later sales? Uh, his brother is, last I checked, principal or first chair uh, clarinetist at the Met. Uh, so he's, this is a remarkably talented family. Uh, he was not implicated in this. Um, uh, and as, as best as I know, uh, was not involved. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, um, this, uh, we have a whole series of questions, just aghast, uh, Amy, why wasn't he jailed and convicted? Stanley isn't receiving stolen goods a crime. Couldn't some of the fly making community be identified and prosecuted? Um, I know myself, before we met, I was calling Fish and Wildlife Service talking about my experiences of seeing specimens that were being sold at, uh, at shows. And um, well, why is there more of a crackdown? Well, the, to answer that, um, and I've, you know, I've, I've spent quite a bit of time talking to Fish and Wildlife folks as well. Um, the truth is uh, that they are motivated by rhinoceros and, and elephant and sexier busts than fly tires with packs of, of, of illicit feathers. Now, I, I was, at some point in this investigation, I was basically just cold calling and cold emailing people 
within the agency saying, why aren't you guys paying attention to this? Because I was, I was on eBay constantly. I, I was pulling so many records of sales of CITES protected species on eBay that I had to hire a, an assistant to basically build this Excel sheet. And I shared that with Fish and Wildlife. Uh, and it was only then that they, I, I can say all this now, it'll, it'll, I'll explain it in a second, but they, they finally called me and said that they were opening an investigation into this, that it was going to be a, a, like an, an active case with, with an agent or two assigned to it. And would I sign on as a confidential informant? I can say that because I'm the least, like if there were crackdowns, like who, who do you think the guy was that t- tipped off the feds? Like it's pretty obvious that it was me. Um, but the, the timing of it is crucial because that phone call happened in December of 2016. Uh, uh, which was the penultimate month of the Obama administration. And so then when Trump came in, the, the, the kind of fledgling case just sort of was closed after that. So um, they don't, it's not a priority of theirs. Um, and the question of how Edwin got away with it, um, you know, it's a, it's a big part of the book, but, uh, but essentially he, his lawyers got him in front of Borat's cousin, Simon Baron Cohen, who is Sasha Baron Cohen's cousin, who is one of the sort of leading experts on Asperger's. And over the course of like a a one hour or so assessment of Edwin, he concluded that Edwin had Asperger's and therefore didn't really realize what he was doing. Now, I mean, I've had a lot of people write to me that, uh, you know, you know, Asperger's doesn't even exist as a standalone diagnosis anymore, but that people who are on the spectrum often have a heightened awareness of right and wrong, that that just because you're you're on the spectrum doesn't mean that you don't recognize that plotting a museum heist for a year and stealing things that aren't yours is a wrong thing. It's a kind of an offensive thing, but but the Brits, um, they were able to basically cite a a series of, of precedents in British case law where people with an assessment of Asperger's were then not ever sent uh, to prison. And obviously Americans, we, we want to throw everyone in prison. So I'm not advocating that, but, uh, but he, he truly was not uh, punished. He had a, a, a confiscation order for something like 10 or $15,000. And then, and then he was sent on his way. So um, there really was no meaningful punishment here. Yeah. Uh, one uh, user asks, uh, how much pushback have you gotten from the fly tying community uh, uh, since uh, the publication? Well, it's interesting because um, one thing I neglected to mention is that the, the overwhelming majority of the men who tie salmon flies, and I say men because I spent years researching this and I did not find a single woman who was tying it. I got excited because at one point I saw a woman posting flies on Facebook, uh, but it was just her husband using her account. But overwhelmingly, the men that tie the Victorian salmon flies do not fish at all. They don't know how to fish. They don't own the gear. This is just an, an art form for them. And I mean, quite honestly, you'd have to be a lunatic to cat to throw a to cast a two thousand uh, two thousand dollars worth of feathers into a river when you can catch salmon with dog fur tied to a hook. I mean, I had some one angler write to me. Uh, with a photo of, of a, a, a great salmon that he caught with a, he had run out of flies and he tied a candy bar wrapper to his hook and caught one. Right. Salmon aren't easy to catch, but they're not, they're not drawn to these particular feathers, obviously. So um, the, there's, a di- there's a very pronounced dichotomy. The ones who don't know how to fish and who tie these salmon flies, they hate me, they hate the book. The fly, the fly fisherman, the guide that first tipped me off to this story 10 years ago in New Mexico, has twice had to go to local law enforcement for specific death threats that he's received from this community for the sin of of telling me about this story in the first place. Um, But the other, the rest of the community, which are actual anglers and people who who know how to fish and who are using trout flies and, and who have a kind of maybe a more realistic awareness and appreciation of nature and of conservation um they all love the book 
uh, and celebrate. But my biggest antagonists with this book have been classic salmon fly tires and the British Museum, which is one of the only museums on earth that won't that just won't carry the book. You can't find it in their gift shop. So, uh, so yeah, it's a strange. I, mean, I think the British Museum never they they weren't able to step past their embarrassment to recognize that this entire book was a love letter to them and to their mission and to their institution. And that I spent all of this time going around the world trying to track down these skins so that they could be returned to that museum for the proper use of these specimens. Um, but, but I think they were, you know, more concerned with what they call rep reputational damage, so. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Raquel. Uh, the disrespectful attitude of the fly tying community aside, is there an argument to be made that fly tires also have valid appreciation of these specimens? for the purpose of art and beauty, if not for scientific knowledge? What if the museum were to sell some of their extras once the scientific data had been collected? I think you should answer that one. Well, you know, I would, <laughs> uh, yes. Well, you know, the interesting thing is that there, uh, we never reach an end result of when uh, we've collected all the data because in fact, obviously DNA wasn't described until, uh, you know, uh, uh, nearly a hundred years after, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 Wallace wrote his paper or collected many of these specimens. Uh, and now, and in fact, we can still, and we do get better and better at acquiring lots of useful uh, DNA uh, specimens uh, from the thing. So, so that that notion is is wrong. And the other the other part about it is um, that uh, we are incredibly highly regulated to make collections uh, uh, today uh, requires lots and lots of permits, which have to go through lots and lots of uh, ongoing uh, regulation. And uh, um, so uh, the, 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 uh, the, those permits would not be given for the purposes of making art. And indeed, you know, one of the interesting things about this is its roots in uh, Victorian mercantile, you know, colonialism, right? Though all those feathers, all those uh, earls who were inventing these flies back in the Victorian era were buying these because they were available from all of the colonies that, uh, that had been gathered, right? So it's really a return to that kind of concept of the world that, 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 that allows this art form to exist. And, uh, and some forms ought to go extinct, you know? And I think, you know, I was just looking at one of the comments, but like the, the you know, initially, when I knew nothing about any of this stuff, um, I thought, well, isn't there something to it? I remember talking to you about this, Rick, like, but that they, here are guys who really love and appreciate these birds. And, and but there was a, it, it quickly, their appreciation for them is in a kind of, I, I, I've used the word deliberately, but it's in a cult like, appreciation where they there is a um there are certain series of flies that are supposed to only be tied with a particular type of feather and when you see when you go deep into all of this these guys talk about the kind of exquisite quality of how this feather can be married to another feather and the way that the that the rachis bends differently than a chicken feather would and and, and all this and so but it's not, it, there's zero science to any of it. And so that's where like, I, you know, I felt like anyone, myself included, like at some point you have to, you have to pick a side here. Like, is this just an aesthetic pursuit and, and beauty for beauty's sake? Or, or are, do these things, should they be used for the, the advancement of human knowledge? And I, I very clearly ended up in the, in the latter camp. Uh, but yeah. There, there are so many uh, uh, great questions here. We won't get to all of them, but uh, I just want to uh, highlight. We have uh, 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 Guy Kerwin, uh, author of uh, Mannequins and Contingos of the World, a monograph on the family, right? Do you think that Rist uh, does not consider himself a thief because he wasn't incarcerated? Um, I don't know how to answer that, to be honest. I, I, I think... Um, I think he still believes that the, these specimens have no uh, rightful place in museums. 
and that the that the that the it's the curators and in fact that you know the, the the South African that I uh, opened this talk with admitted to me in an on the record interview that he still has many of these birds that he bought from Edwin, but he refuses to send them back to the British Museum uh, because he doesn't care, but also because he believes that these curators are doing the devil's work and that they're pushing evolution and, and all of this sort of satanic stuff in his mind. And also he knows that, um, that in, this is not going to rise to the level of like an Interpol international operation to go and reclaim these things, especially if the British Museum is not clamoring for it. Um, and so, you know, I think if you if you discount the value of the thing that you stole, then I think it makes it easier to discount the the your own culpability in it. And so that, that's my best guess at, at why he could say like, he's not a thief. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, last question, I've lost a, uh, it, it in the feed, but uh, um, do you uh, worry that this uh, may uh, actually encourage future, uh, future thefts? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it certainly crossed my mind, but um, I will say that one of the consequences of this book has been uh, and I, I see that there's a lot of curators on the thread here, but um, this does seem to have led to something of a, of, a, of, a, of a wake up in the curator community where, you know, I went to the Smithsonian and they now have locks on the, on the specimens that are referenced in, in, um, in the Feather Thief. I gave a talk in Denver and some deep pocketed donor at the Denver Museum went up to the curators at the end of my talk and and wrote a check or committed a huge amount of money to them to upgrade their security for the collection. Um, I have been, which was not a, a desire of mine to be totally honest, but a sort of unofficial security consultant to, to this community where I get emails regularly from museums around the world who are forwarding requests uh, for access to their collections from people who they suspect might be salmon fly tires. And on more than one occasion, I've had to write to these institutions to say, like, no, you absolutely should not let this person <laughs> person in, knowing what I know about them. Uh, I, you know, I don't. I don't. My wife isn't particularly thrilled that you know that career shift of me becoming a, a museum <laughs> security consultant. But even you know, even Occidental out here. I live in Los Angeles, and um, Occidental has the Moore Lab of, of Zoology, and um, I'm I'm close friends with with the head of that lab, John McCormick, who, I mean, he just sent me proudly uh, like a screenshot of all of their new surveillance and security measures and things like that. So, um, so I, I think there are probably new people that have entered this community of fly time, but it's also, I think, become a lot harder to steal these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I'm sorry that, that we won't have time to get into all the rest of the questions. Uh, but at this point, I want to thank you, the audience, uh, for your attendance. And thanks, Kirk. Uh, and best uh, wishes, uh, best good luck with the launch of the new book. Um, and I look forward to, to that read as well as this. And I know we'd have a great uh, uproarious applause if we were all together. But <laughs> you certainly have mine. Uh, thank you very much, Kirk. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. Thank you, Rick. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Kirk. And uh, thanks once again, Ty and Guy, for helping uh, make this such a success. Bye, everyone, and see you next week.